Um, how you guys doing? Just a couple opening remarks. Um, listen, obviously it's been a difficult season. Uh, yesterday we made some tough decisions. Um, I have great respect for Frank Reich. He's a fine man. Also, Coach Tabor moved on from Josh and Deuce yesterday, who are also very good men. Uh, Tabor will be up to answer questions on them later. With that, I'll just open it for questions. If y'all hang on, I will, I will select everybody uh, for questions. So if you want to raise your hand, take the first question from Dave. You uh, admitted you made some mistakes with the hiring of Matt Rule. What were the mistakes in the hiring of Frank Wright? Um, you know, look, every coach that we've had here has been, um, has had contributions to this organization. Um, Frank has contributions to the organization. Matt had contributions to the organizations. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, if I had my druthers, I'd like to have a coach here for 20 years or 30 years, you know, if I can do that. Um, you know, I'm not going to get into the individual sort of things. Um, you guys can just speculate as to that. Uh, but, uh, you know, we just moved on yesterday, and that's that. Okay, first we'll have uh, Joe Person followed by Steve Reed. Dave, you guys are 30 and 63 since you became owner. I think it's the second worst mark in the NFL, one of the worst marks in pro sports. You're about to hire your fourth head coach. Do you need to reevaluate re the way you do things in terms of, A, maybe using a, a search firm in this hiring process, but also in how you manage day-to-day -day operations here? Um, look, things are constantly evolving. Um, and they'll continue to evolve. And, you know, trying to make things better is what you always try to do. Um, obviously, that record's not good enough. Um, you know, there's no hiding it. It is what it is, like everything in this sport. Everything's left on the field. You, everybody knows what it is every week. Um, that record's that record. And, it, like I said, it's not good enough. We're going to self-reflect and make it better. Dave, um, uh, Dave, you fired three coaches during the season, um, you know, in the, in the, since the time you took over. Do you feel like that is going to make it more difficult to get a quality head coach here uh, if you hire one, choose to hire one, someone uh, next year? No. And why? I think that, I don't know, and again, I'm not going to get into it here, but I think that, um, you know, it's, there are different reasons why different things happened in each, each case. Um, you guys see, like I said, everything is out in the field. Everything is known over time. And I think people know it. The league knows it. And people in the league know it. So I think that um, if we were, if we, everything was perfect, it wouldn't be the case. And everything was good, it wouldn't be the case. So it's not as if it's not known out there reasons. And, you know, that will be something for people to decide. Just generally speaking, and not here, but and not that this matters because this is here. But, you know, in other aspects of my life, we have people for 20, 30 years that work for me. Nobody ever leaves me. Uh, we'll go uh, Phil Orbit and Josh Klein. Uh, when Matt was hired, you, you preached patience and it was kind of a year over year evaluation. Um, Frank gets fired 11 weeks in. To what extent was that due to a maybe a philosophical shift in how you view timelines for a rebuild or turnaround? Um, look, you know, as I said, there are reasons for each individual situation. I think you guys, upon re your own reflection into looking what happened through the season, can uh, you know can understand that. You're around town for the, those that are around town and can know the reasons. Um, again, I'm not going to get into that particularly into those particulars, but I have pa I do have patience. I'm just not <laughs> – my reputation away from this game is one for extreme patience. You know, there's no reason why that doesn't, you know, come here too. It does. Now, that patience comes with good performance and things that you want to see progress be made on, on different aspects. Um, and as, you know, as I said, you know, I would like to have somebody here for 20, 30 years. I'd like to – have somebody <laughs> that would say eulogy at my funeral in 30 years. Okay, maybe it's 40 years, I hope. But uh, that's what I'd like to have. 
Next we'll have uh, Mike Kay and Eric Spamberg. Yeah, you preached. Uh, oh, you okay. talked about. You talked about your patience. It's a lot of preaching that I'm doing. Right <laughs> now, so. uh, you you talked about your patience uh, when you moved on from Ron Rivera. You <clears throat> urged the fan base to have patience in terms of bringing in sustained excellence, sustained success. What would your message to fans be now, uh, four years later, that maybe feel like their patience hasn't been rewarded or, or they're, it's not moving in the right direction right now? You know, um, every week, you know, I watch these games. And I've watched, you know, been around football for a long time. And listen, once upon a time, I was just a fan, poor kid in Pittsburgh. That's what I was. So I know what it is to be a fan, and every day, every week we come in, it's part of us are fans. Okay, Nicole and I sit in that box, and we live and die with every play. Uh, so I understand how the fans, and I understand their frustration, and I appreciate that. Um, I can just say this, we will make it better. I'm not promising that's going to happen tomorrow, but it may, okay? Football is a really interesting thing, what can happen in two or three year time span. And what you're trying to do is have every single building block you can for, you know, an organization. And in this organization, you know, while you don't see it, you know, because you see all you see is on the field, but you guys may know it or may not know it. But behind the scenes, there's been a lot of different changes in the building and a lot of things that have come, become a lot better inside the building, you know, and just, just how different people communicate, you know, health, you know, um, strength room and, you know, and uh, medical people. You know, um, football operations, nutrition, all those things, all those building blocks underneath the surface have gotten better than when I stepped in the door. Listen, they're, they're, they may be easier things to do, okay? And so we have to make sure that every, the other things that the fans can see is better too. And also I would say that for, you know, uh, engagement with path, past Panthers, and that, you know, we should invite you to talk to people who, you know, legends that were here at the Panthers. So we have not gotten what, what the fans see every day, right? I understand their frustration. We share that frustration every Sunday with them. David, in, in April, you said when you guys drafted Bryce, you said that he was a point guard style distributor and who could elevate the talent around him. My question to you is, do you feel like you've put enough around him for him to elevate? And with that said, how will that evaluation of the roster in the next six weeks factor into how you evaluate the front office? Look, um, you know, there's a lot that goes into, you know, what the success on the field is every week. One is roster, some is scheme, how you practice, a lot of things. And obviously we can be better in all phases of that because the product on the field is just not good enough right now. It just isn't. And so we have to try to make every one of those phases better. And whatever it takes to make it better, we're going to try to do. Dave, you've obviously had a lot of changes, not just on the football side, but on the administrative side, also with Charlotte FC. Uh, and you just mentioned a few minutes ago that you're patient. So why do you think there is so much constant churn in this organization, and what can you do to stabilize it? Um, it's, you know, that's an interesting question. Uh, when you talk about that churn and then the, what the results are, you know, for that churn, you, you, what you call churn. Um, you know, every case is something is done here. There's not, it's not just done because it's done by idle wish. There's a reason and there's a purpose and there's a result and the things goes on. When you talk about the, you know, different parts of this, um, this franchise or this building, if you, that you're referring to the business, you're a business guy, um, you know, when we came here, there were 10 events a year in this stadium, basically, plus one or two more, maybe. Um, we do, I think we did 42 events last year um, in this field, not counting high school football that we brought back for the first time in this stadium and other things like that, other type charity things. So they're not even counting those sort of things, but major type events. Um, brought soccer to Charlotte. The, the stands are full. Um, if you were at that last game with Miami, I mean, it was a joyful sort of experience when Messi came to town and, and I think the fans were elated in that sort of, you know, in that point. And there have been highs, you know, and there's been highs and lows everywhere. Every game is a, there's some highs, there's some lows. Gano's big kick, um, you know, when Eric Reed was here for the first game. So there's highs in footballs and, and other places. But when you look at, you know, any, you're, since you're asking a business question, I'll answer a business question. 
when you look at us and how we have and how we do business and how are we successful in, in pulling off all these different events we put here, yeah, we are. And what we've done is really uh, led to higher economic impact for Charlotte. And we look at the future for things like that as things that we might do in the future, whether they're an inter entertainment venue that may do 80 more sort of small concerts, three to 5,000 people that will bring t people down there. We'll bring that here. And we think we brought a lot of econo uh, economic development into the town. We have. The numbers show it. I mean, you know the numbers. Um, so I don't think that when you look at the management team and you look at the stability of the management team now, we finally, I think we, and, and, and listen, you're always trying to make it better. But I think we have a pretty good management team on the business side right now. And we are pulling off pretty seamlessly all these events. Thank you very much, Dave. I appreciate it. Hey, all right, thank you. Yeah. Bruce, he, he, just, he, he said okay to me. All right, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, appreciate it, Mr. Tepper. Uh, in terms of Bryce Young, I want to jump back on what Mike said earlier about Bryce. There's been a lot of reports over the last few days, in fact, that that Frank wanted C.J. Stroud. You tipped the scales and said you wanted Bryce Young. Is that true? And then also seeing what C.J. Stroud is doing in Houston, did that make it the comparisons even that much greater because of what you're seeing in Houston as opposed to here? Um, just the way our processes go here, and I'll just answer this really plain. On all, these, on all those decisions, um, you know, whether it was a head coach, whether it was Bryce, I don't really vote on those decisions until the last piece. Okay, so those decisions are made by, you know, in the case of the, by the football people. Now, look, everything that's right and everything that's wrong here ultimately is my fault. Okay, I have the final say. But as far as those decisions, whether it's Frank Wright or it's Bryce Young, um, those decisions were made. And in the case of Bryce, it was almost, a, I believe it was a unanimous decision on the coaches and the, and the scouts and very strong opinions at the time. Um, now, it's been reported and we talked about it. Originally, we were going to go to the number two pick and, and uh, we thought we would get CJ because we thought the Texans were going to pick Bryce. And listen, we preferred Bryce. He was our number one pick. We had a lot of conviction. Um, but, uh, you know, the, in, in answer to your questions, it's just not the way the process was done. The process was done the way the process was done. And again, even though if there was a process with five people in the room and, four, and the way the votes came in, it was Frank was the first choice, I always could veto that choice. And even if it was Bryce and the votes came in unanimously in this particular case, I could have vetoed that choice. In both cases, I supported both choices. Okay? I'm just going to say that I supported both choices. I supported the coaches. I supported the scouts, their unanimous opinion. Um, and I supported uh, Frank Reich. So um, whatever's good, bad, or indifferent is ultimately because the buck stops here, and I take full responsibility for everything. But that's the way the process runs. And just one last thing, and then we'll, we're, we're going to go here. As far as Bryce Young is concerned, I cannot say this, you know, for myself, and I think everybody in this building would share this sentiment, we are totally confident in that pick. Okay, I think the people that made that pick first, um, you know, would be totally confident in that. Um, you know, some of them you could ask. Okay. Um, and I think the, um, and, and for me, I'm totally confident in agreeing with that pick. Thank you.
I'll also open the remarks, then I'll open up the questions. So. All right. Morning, everybody. First and foremost, I'd just like to say this. Uh, these are tough times. And... Uh, because you're talking about uh, relationships, and that's what coaching is. You, you have relationships with players. You have relationships with, with other coaches. And a decision was made, uh, and, and I understand that, and, and because the NFL is also a business. And so I'm, I'm well aware of that, and I'm very grateful and thankful for Coach Wright keeping me around last year when, when he first got here. And at the same time, I'm thankful for Mr. Tepper having confidence in me uh, to have this opportunity to lead the team uh, these next six games. So we're moving forward. Uh, today's a big work day, big game plan day. So uh, with that, uh, I'll answer any questions. All right. I'll pick up any questions that you know. Questions for Coach Tabor. Uh, Coach Tabor, Kyle Bailey, WFNZ. What directive, what mandate have you been given for the rest of this season? What do they want to see out of this team after a 1-10 in 10 start with you know no postseason on the horizon? Like, What, what are those checklists that need to be hit? Well, I think obviously everything that we're always trying to do is, is, is put ourselves in position to win games, and that's what we're working on. I mean, really what we're doing right now, and I know it's very cliche-ish, but there's, there's a process, and today's Tuesday's process. We've got to win today to set us up for tomorrow, and if we can do those things, I always say that sets you up for success and gives you an opportunity for, for success on Sunday, and uh, that's, that's what we're trying to get done. David Boone. Yeah, Chris, uh, how, how much did your changes you made yesterday with um, getting rid of Josh McCown and um, Staley had to do with the development of Bryce Young and trying to improve that? Well, first and foremost, I'd, I'd, I'd say this. Uh, I made those decisions, and as I mentioned earlier in my opening statement, coaching is about relationships, and I, I respect both those coaches as people and, and coaches and, and uh I'm going to keep our talks uh, in-house, uh, and and what anything that we do, we're always trying to to continue to improve our team. Alex, hey Chris, uh, thanks for taking the time. Uh, you were the interim coach for a game in uh, for one game in 2021 when uh, the head coach, coach Navy had COVID. Yeah, yeah. Um, what did you learn from that experience and? Are there any lessons that are transferable into the situation you're in now? No, I think a lot of things that I, I learned there. Um, it happened a couple times. Also in, in the spring, uh, Coach got COVID uh, during OTA, so I was responsible for the team during the week there. And then when we played San Francisco around Halloween, I believe it was. Um, things that you learn, I mean, I have my special teams area now, and, and, and really you just kind of expand everything. You know, I have to oversee offense and defense and game game management, but those are a lot of things that I'm always doing anyway. Uh, it's just now I just have to have a little bit more of a, a peripheral view. Yeah, yeah. Um, this will be the, the second and or third play caller that Bryce will be having uh, this year. Uh, will this will this transition be fluid for him? I think Bryce will do great. Thomas will call the plays, and Thomas has already called the plays, so I think it's, it's very easy. Coach, elaborate a little bit on that with Thomas Brown regaining play calling abilities with Jim Colville looking over. Speak a little bit to how that relationship will kind of work and how you will conversate, have conversations with him on the sideline. Well, I'm going to let him work. And uh, my, my job is to help facilitate game management and, and, and work from there. But uh, collectively, the offensive staff, they're up there right now and they're, ga they're game plan. They're all working together. So it's a, it's a unified group uh, working towards one common goal. Brett? I got grabbed. After Brett, we'll go, go. Uh, Chris, in terms of offensive philosophies, because, you know, the offense obviously has been an issue all year, with, have you spoken to Caldwell and Thomas about that changing of the offensive philosophies or anything else that you guys are going to try and change? We've or talked. Or status quo? No, we've talked about things. And at the same time, uh, I'm going to probably keep those in-house. And uh, you can't overhaul ev everything. But I think you can do some things, and, and uh, we'll work on that. Two, two part question. Were you given any sort of uh, assurance, might not be the right word, but were you told you'll have an opportunity to have this gig full time? And then. No, uh, I, I, I haven't had that assurance. I'm, and to be honest with you, I'm just, I'm working on today. And that, that's all I'm focused on. And secondly, you were obviously here last year when Steve took over. What, did, what will you take away from how he handled it? 
you guys finished up pretty strong, obviously. I think there's a lot of things you can learn from that that experience right there. I, I think it still goes back to, to just winning the day and winning the process. And I and like I said earlier, I know it's very coach speak and those things, but I, I do I do believe that. Uh, because in this business, I mean, the NFL train is always moving and the NFL monster will eat you at any time and you need to be prepared and you need to take the proper steps to set yourself up for success. And, and that's what we're trying to work on right now. Coach, in addressing the team after this transition, what was important for you to convey? There were some things that we talked about that I'm going to, I'm going to keep in house. Um, I, I would say this, and I, and I talk about this in our special teams unit, if it, when you turn the tape on, I just want people to say that's a classy, hard-hitting unit that plays with great unity. And that's, that's probably how I'd sum that up. Yeah. Colin Wall has a lot of experience. Is that someone you're going to lean on in the background? Oh, 100%. I mean, think, think about, okay, I'm the interim head coach for six games. We have Coach Caldwell down the hall, Coach Capers down the hall, two very highly successful uh, coaches and men in this league. So, yes, I... I <laughs> I go to them quite a bit. Mike Salate, followed by Shima. Chris Whitaker. What is you what is your philosophy and your thought on keeping this room together? Because when a coach is is dismissed, I mean there's the real potential for fracturing and for guys to kind of not be on the same page. Well, uh, here's how I look at it. Um, the tape is all that matters. That that's my resume. How how for example, how my units play, that, that's my resume. How a player plays, that's his resume. And what I would say uh, to anyone, I've used this before and because I've been in this situation before, uh, when there's change, all you can handle is what you can do. And you need to take care of your business because when things change and people begin to review the tape, um, they're, they're studying you. Do, do we want to keep this player? Do we want to keep this coach? So it's in your best interest to do your job at the highest level, regardless of what your record is, regardless of what the situation is. You're a professional football player, you're a professional coach. Be a pro, and, and that's how I look at it. We'll take two more. we go David, and then we'll go Joe one more time. Chris. Oh, oh I see him. Uh, Gina, we will not forget you. Why do you think that Frank was fired and you're here today as the interim coach? I have no opinion on that. I, here, here's my deal. I, I'm, I'm staying in my lane. I was presented an opportunity, and now, you know, things have changed for me in my role, and that's what I'm just concentrating on. Uh, you and Jim Caldwell have already made one decision in tandem. Um, can you share with us what his role will be going forward? I, I made that decision, and uh, those are always tough decisions. Uh, but Parks Frazier will be our quarterback coach, and Coach Caldwell will be in that room helping, and Thomas Brown will be our play caller and coaching the running backs. Chris, are there uh, are there any players or personnel groupings that you want to change? And maybe get some guys on the field that we haven't seen a lot of the, these first eleven games. We'll probably shy away from some of those answers right now, you know, and just kind of let the tape and, and the play speak for itself. Thank you, Coach. Thanks, everybody.